Um, I'd like to introduce to you Bart Beekner. Uh, he's going to be doing so, uh, social and re relational factors in depression. Um, take bits and pieces from each one of these presentations. Um, we feel that every part, every presentation that we are presenting today um, can help someone, it can help you connect with someone, um, use it to your advantage, uh, and, and, and help our veterans and their families. So please, Dr. Beekner, please. Okay. Well, thanks, Elena. Uh, you know, I realized I neglected a, a question a little bit ago. We were trying to see who was in the audience. How many folks here would identify yourself just as concerned citizen, not really connected in any way with the military or veterans? Concerned citizen. Couple. Thank you. Thank you for being here, because that's, that's an important audience, and yet it's one that's very often neglected. So what I wanted to do today is just, or this afternoon or this morning, I guess, we're getting close to afternoon, is talk a little bit about the notion of community, how community works, and how it connects with, uh, with alienation and depression and how that uh, uh, veterans may have something uh, from their experiences to offer our communities. Uh, and Joe Bobrow uh, explained this one time, we keep talking about veterans reintegration uh, veterans don't just come back to America, they come back to communities. And if the community isn't integrated in the first place, it's kind of hard to talk about reintegration. So, uh, and then when we start talking about how our community is integrated, that brings up the subject of leadership. And I promised I'm not going to keep hawking books, but uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff being written right now by uh, military leaders, because as, you, as, as everybody here well knows, leadership is a constantly evolving and changing thing, particularly in the military, and very often what our civilian brethren and, com and uh, comrades think they know about military leadership as a top-down directive activity uh, haven't been around military leadership lately. So there are two books uh, that I'm particularly uh, impressed with that are recently out. One is uh, about two years ago, Team of Teams by Stanley McChrystal, who was the head of Special Forces uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he came up with the realization, and a lot of corporate people have gotten hold of this book and really gotten some wisdom out of it, because his realization is if you're fighting an asynchronous uh, enemy, as you are in Special Forces, uh, then you have to be asynchronous as well. Uh, and that basically means that you're not a uh, uh, top-down uh, organization that people can see coming six miles away. You know, you're a little more integrated and you can respond directly. So uh, when, when things present themselves in, a, in an uncontrolled un environment. So his metaphor was we've got to stop acting like orchestra conductors and all these other metaphors for leaders and start thinking of ourselves as, as leaders as being gardeners. So we're actually creating the condition, we're growing uh, people who are able to respond and act uh, as, as necessary as the situation uh, dictates. The other one, much more recent, just came out last year. Uh, it's called Radical Inclusion uh, by Martin Dempsey, who was a chief of uh, staff under the Obama administration, and he was assisted by Ori Bronfman, uh, who is a uh, professor at Berkeley University, if you could imagine anything more kind of diametrically opposed than a general and a Berkeley professor. Uh, but they came together looking at what happened in Berkeley where there was a riot and the, uh, uh, the police backed off and didn't intervene and then everybody is uh, pointing fingers at everybody else. So it was those, it was those liberals, it was that, that conservative speaker, it's the neo-Nazis. Neo you know, there's, there's a, a culprit behind every curtain and yet none of them seem to be uh, responsible for all of this. And uh, between the two of them, they sorted out what actually happened. And the conclusion uh, that uh, uh, General Dempsey came up with is that leaders in this era have to think more about creating a compelling, compelling narrative that people can feel included in. So he calls his book Radical Inclusion. And the idea is that leadership is, is not about uh, fighting other people with facts, which is kind of the, the nature of scholarly debate back into the Aristotelian era and probably beyond. Uh, we're not winning that argument. We're not uh, winning hearts and minds, uh, which was a big issue for the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. They came over to win <coughs> hearts and minds. They were told that's what they were there to do. And then finally, the hearts and minds are the two best places to shoot. So 
Uh, it's, it's a little bit different metaphor, uh, but uh, it, it sounds cynical, but, and, and yet that's the reality we're looking at, and part of that realization is, is, uh, is understanding that. So uh, Dempsey uh, pointed out that, that basically the role of the leader is to create a compelling and inclusive uh, narrative that we can all buy into and that we can all not feel alienated from. So it, it sounds easy to say that, but it's hard to do it. And that kind of brings us to the topic of talking about this, the social and relational and how uh, we get uh, left out in some ways and then that causes our bodies to feel rejected. And uh, we're going to hear later on today from uh, Jeff Bird about the, the uh, the social connection in, connect, in, in uh, understanding suicidality and maybe a different way to, to comprehend why uh, that's been a problem for some of our uh, returning veterans. But uh, this, is the, this is the legalese thing. This stuff is going to be available to you after the conference, so uh, I just had to say I don't really have any dog in this fight. I'm not selling any books uh, today. But, um, uh, what we want to talk about is really how communication and identity play a role in, in the, uh, the process of, of depression. And we talked, uh, Dr. Troiani talked a lot about Adlerian psychology and how it looks at the relational uh, context of the individual and not just the, uh, what's going on inside of the brain, which Freud was very uh, much preoccupied with. And then uh, how this affects both moral injury and uh, post-traumatic stress, and then why integrative, uh, procedure, integrative processes were the way to go. Now, just as one example for this, I wanted to, to show this, which is uh, a, a, a kind of a, a diagram uh, developed by Bill Nash, who's a VA psychologist who's been working a lot with uh, the constructs of moral injury. And uh, I hasten to say that this is not a new thing. It's been around since the Greeks and the Romans and before that. But uh, we're finding now that it's helpful to go back and look at that uh, construct uh, as a maybe uh, a way to course correct for some of the directions that we've gone recently in over uh, sciencizing things. And that is not to say that science gives us problems. Science gives us a lot of wonderful realizations and new ways to see the world. But uh, it also is somewhat inadequate when trying to explain the complexity of human emotions, human actions, uh, human free will, and the, uh, the theological and, uh, and philosophical components of our beings. Uh, and so uh, the over, trying to apply empirical methods to something that is more of a human dimension is called scienti scientism, uh, which is not generally a good thing. And it's just a good reminder that we need to put a balance so that when we're trying to put balance in the world, our indigenous uh, wisdom tells us we go back to the circle. In this case, uh, Nash has this circle that says, here are the things that are affected by moral injury. And again, this is available to you after the conference. I'm not going to dwell on it right now because I have a time schedule to meet, I believe. Thank you. Okay, I'm good. Um, so these are things like our worldview, which is the most important one. Our worldview is a very complex thing that's formed uh, from our family relationships and on out into the military uh, and then back into civilian life after that. Our concept of self or identity, uh, the relationships with others, which is really what we're talking about here. Uh, our emotions, which very often get detached from uh, what's going on and, and become a sense of discomfort. And then this whole nation, uh, whole notion rather, of, of uh, time. Uh, do, uh, in, in the case of uh, a, a time, uh, time uh, awareness, uh, one of the phenomena associated with trauma is the destruction of our ability to regulate time. Uh, so something that happened yesterday could be just as real as something that's, that's uh, going on now. And so being able to manage that uh, and, and take authority or self-efficacy are all kind of features of understanding uh, the effects of the human body uh, on the human uh, psyche of, uh, of moral injury or, or traumatic stress. So Mr. Nash's point is that if we're going to engage in all these complex uh, uh, constructs here, then we have uh, theology, religion, history, philosophy, literature, art, mythology, and science as all domains of knowledge that are relevant to these things. It's not just science. Science is cool, but 
science can't run the whole show, and that's pretty much the point of that. Uh, this is something that those of you that have been engaged with this conference over time or, uh, and, and knew uh, the late uh, Chaplain Kieser are very aware of, but uh, we now have a uh, reasonably uh, concise definition of moral injury, and that's uh, exposure to an experience that, uh, uh, that transgress our moral uh, beliefs and expectations. And that uh, is not too hard to imagine happening in combat when everything is in a, a condition of liminality or out of controlness. Uh, so, uh, my friend, the uh, psychologist from uh, uh, Field and Graduate University, uh, Jeremy, uh, has worked out a, uh, a kind of a schema for uh, this, which is you have the event and then it creates an internal conflict and acts, uh, causes us to ask existential questions about our identity and whether we can move forward or not. And then we either integrate. Uh, we, we reconcile that event and move forward, which can often involve personal growth, uh, referred to in the literature as post-traumatic growth, or uh, we can't re reconcile it and it moves into the, the space of injury or, uh, uh, or pathology. So uh, one of the reasons that this is problematic in America, uh, we can go back to Joseph Campbell if anybody's a fan of uh, uh, mythology. Uh, there's this, uh, what Campbell said is the universal monomyth. This is the, the myth of the hero that uh, goes out, uh, leaves the community. Notice leaves the community is an important part. He goes out on the quest, runs into unimaginable things, and then comes back to the community with some benefit, uh, beneficial knowledge or beneficial gift, uh, and the community welcomes this hero back. And the problem in America is that's not the monomyth. It's not what we see in movies and TV and stories and so forth. So we're storytelling beings. Uh, we live in communities and we tell stories to impart meaning to things. So now what do we have? Superman, the Lone Ranger, uh, the list goes on. Just go through Marvel Comics and, uh, and DC and you'll, you'll have it. But these are all folks with superpowers. They don't necessarily fit in with the rest of us. And uh, when they, they're done you know, vanquishing evil, there is no place for them in the community. They've got to go to Mount Olympus or uh, you know, the, the, uh, the cave or someplace. They, they can't come back, yeah, the back cave. They can't, uh, they can't stick around. So you can see that that might have some consequences for post-service uh, uh, thought process. So then the problem then is then the, uh, the service member is kind of left with all this baggage uh, uh, that uh, psychological baggage, but there's no place to ground it out. There's no one they can talk to that they perceive that they can talk to. So uh, internalized, that can be a ticking time bomb. So how do we bring veterans back into community? And again, I, I, I thank and profusely the, the two or three uh, non-connected folks that are here. So I, I would put that out as a challenge to the whole group. How do we have the kind of conversation in our communities that invites this kind of uh, dialogue and discussion in the way that we conduct our civil affairs and is it a function of leadership? So just something to think about. Uh, I just got back from uh, Germany a couple days ago, which is probably why I'm a little incoherent, uh, but I had gone to a, uh, a conference on the philosophy of Alfred Schutz, uh, who was a German philosopher at about the time that uh, uh, the Nazis took over Germany, so he had to leave, and it, it profoundly affected some of his beliefs about the goodness of human nature and so on and so forth. But uh, Schutz pioneered the notion of uh, the life world as a way of understanding our being. And uh, this kind of quote from uh, a couple of uh, successor phenomenologists, which again is a nasty word if you're a Marine Corps, uh, veteran, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it gives us basically an understanding of how our psyche is formed by the experiences that we have. So uh, we, we take our lived experiences, and, and these are important things. And again, uh, another interesting finding that I came away from Mr. Schutz's conference with is uh, there has been a great deal of empirical study done on treatments for various and sundry um, 
met forms of mental pathology. And what they discovered is looking at a cross-section of all of these across many different types of uh, so-called disorders, uh, the, the, the technology itself, the method, has much less to do with the success of the treatment than the relation, and any psychologist in this room will be nodding right now, than the relationship between the therapist, the alliance, uh, the bonds that are formed, and the ability to reconstruct a coherent worldview or a form of uh, uh, system of meaning making. So that's pretty much what it's all about. Uh, eye motion, hypnotism, that's cool stuff, but it helps get to a certain place it brings you down to a level where you can engage again socially, and that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, Jonathan Shea, who uh, is not a stranger to many of us here, uh, took the, uh, the uh, sociological viewpoint of Talcott Parsons and said, we've got to, in, in, in scientific terms here, we've got to engage the whole human critter. We can't just do part of it. And the human critter is uh, brain, mind, society, and culture. And he adds to that the dynamics of mental health. So this is the, the ways that we have of understanding how we are healthy. This I am not going to spend any time at all on because it's going to be available to you to look at later. But it's just a model that uh, helps us to analyze uh, how our brain uh, the systems of society, uh, the influences of culture, and our, our minds uh, are kind of interactive agents in forming this worldview. And uh, so when we start talking about an integrative, uh, an integrative practice, we can see that on the brain side, you know, we've, we've got the, the capacity for our brains to be injured, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, but we also have the ability to do embodied practices, somatic uh, engagement, to change the way our, our minds are, or our brains rather, are interacting with the world around us. Uh, we have also on the lower left of the quadrant right here, uh, we have this, uh, what doc, Dr. Troiani mentioned as uh, military cultural competence, so that there's an ability to bridge between the, the meaning systems that are in the military culture and that that occurs with employers and families uh, in particular and the other systems of our, our society. And finally, we have the spiritual component of the mind, mindfulness, uh, spiritual awareness, and uh, the understanding that, we're, that neuroscience is leading us to that uh, the brain is actually responsive like the muscles in our body. You can develop your muscles by uh, acting and thinking in different ways. Uh, we can do the same thing with our brain structures uh, by engaging in somatic practices. So uh, again, uh, we're talking about communication uh, in, a, in a holistic sense as the unifying thread that allows us to think about this in a more uh, integrated way. Uh, when we think then about the ways that moral code, if that's the essence of, uh, of moral injury, can be changed is to look at uh, back to common sense as a way to understand why certain things are, are troubling us and then what we can do about it. And, and again, one of, one of the, the shifts of thought that we engage in when we think of moral injury as opposed to post-traumatic stress disorder is that we think about now just, we don't have to change the individual, but sometimes we have to change something about the environment. And this is the notion where veterans tell us something very valuable and important about where we're going wrong uh, as a society and, and how that we should go about uh, thinking together differently to produce a different result than, than the result that has put them into an encounter with something that is uh, uh, causing the disturbance in the first place. Uh, again, uh, oh, I'm hawking another book, yes, uh, Mike Walker, uh, who has written quite a lot about uh, the social construction of mental illness and, uh, and what that means for neuroplasticity. Um, Let's see, how do I put this delicately? Based, basically, anything, any mental illness that's defined in the uh, DSM, which is the Diagnostic of the Statistical uh, Treatments, uh, is basically a human construct. In other words, we have measured the statistical probability that a human being is going to behave in a certain way and say, this pattern of behavior matches this label. Uh, so 
this can help us uh, in the area of diagnosing what could be done and what are the appropriate range of, of uh, treatments and responses, but it can also hurt us if we, t if we uh, turn those diagnoses uh, in, into uh, social constructs where we feel like we're putting people in a position where they're constrained to behave in a certain way because they've received this diagnosis. And, and Walker puts this uh, in uh, very clear terms and offers some alternatives to think about these, uh, these constructs. But uh, again, one of the things we really don't want to do is contribute to putting veterans in a straitjacket where they feel like they uh, have to behave in a certain way and are, only can have certain identities in society going forward because that, that's not correct. Um, how do we make meaning? Again, we're, we're storytelling entities. Uh, the problem, or part of the problem, uh, in a, in a very concrete way, is that uh, the military has its own certain forms of communication. I think we like to say that the military uh, communication to communication is like military music to music. Uh, there's a whole range of expression out there musically, but military music is only that part of it. So uh, when veterans come back, this is why people like uh, Randall Locke are here are so important because they help uh, veterans when they go back to college, for example, translate uh, their terminology and ways of communing in, into those, communicating into those that are going to interface well with the environment that they're in. We do the same thing. Uh, for employment. A lot of employers are uh, getting on board with uh, adaptive uh, support for veterans coming back. They bring in uh, the leadership skills, they bring in a lot of capabilities and, and characteristics that are very helpful, but at the same time there is a communication gap and it's not often recognized. So uh, I'm an advocate for humanities studies uh, for veterans and it's not always uh, what they hear when they come back to school. It's like, okay, I need to go to get an IT degree or I, I need to you know, pick up on something that's gonna get me a job. Uh, and we don't talk about the humanities as much. Adlerian psychology, uh, as we heard earlier, is uh, uh, touching on all of these things. It's uh, uh, and here are the, the, these are the five characteristics of Adlerian psychology, which is uh, that we, we have the ability to self-determine, uh, be creative, that we are indivisibly engaged with the social world around us. It is part of us and we are part of it. And alienating ourselves or separating us from that has very, uh, very uh, bad consequences. Uh, we are directed towards goals. We're moving towards something in the future. We're not just static. Uh, and that we have a sense of, of self uh, where we, uh, and, and relational uh, connections with other people, that's called subjectivity and intersubjectivity, to use the scientific terms. Uh, the search, for, we are part of a pattern uh, of, uh, of social interaction, not just uh, an isolated entity. And finally, uh, one of the things that uh, we have really worked to make a connection on at Adler is that being part of, uh, the military uh, is defending ideals that lead us towards social justice and diversity. It's like uh, uh, General Dempsey concluding that inclusiveness is what we should be all about as leaders. Uh, that is a realization that becomes very apparent to, uh, to veterans. Uh, uh, a friend of mine who has now passed away, unfortunately, uh, developed an entire theory of social construction and communication uh, that we do consider as part of our, our uh, coursework at Adler, uh, and that is how do we change that social world uh, to make it more coherent and to allow us to uh, uh, evolve our own consciousness. So these are uh, parallel endeavors. How do we evolve ourselves and how do we involve our institutions? Unfortunately, think about uh, those of us that are members of an organization of some kind, uh, have, have they changed really a, a lot in the last 200 years? Uh, sometimes we hang on to forms of organization that no longer serve us well just because uh, as human beings we're holding on to that, but we need to think about other ways of being. So I'm not going to go into CMM theory uh, here, thank God, uh, because we have lunch coming up, but uh, uh, I'll just... Uh, kind of Ill, Ill, introduce a thought of uh, Mr. Schutz that we talked about earlier, who observed that he has, he evolved this whole brilliant theory 
of understanding social systems, then looked around uh, the gathering storm clouds in Nazi Germany and said, all of my theory is not going to help us change any of this. All it's going to do is help us better chronicle the collapse of a great civilization. And let that sink in for a minute because it's pretty profound. So the notion is if we have the abilities and we have now uh, a, a social world that is so complex, so interconnected, uh, thanks to the internet, which is both a blessing and a curse uh, for us, we've got to figure out how to manage it or we've got trouble. But we have the capacity and some intellectual tools to be able to socially construct something better for ourselves. And my, one of my arguments uh, in the academic world is that veterans have some unique insights into that. And uh, I'm a big advocate for publishing more research about veterans that's done by veterans because that has the, uh, the, in, uh, the insight and understanding of what this experience really is all about. So the other... Uh, key feature of this, and, and again, we think about how do we look at veterans coming back. Uh, okay, you set aside, you take off your uniform, you set that part of yourself aside, and we're going to give you a new identity. We just need to figure out what it is. So go talk to the career counselor, you know, go, go talk to somebody, and uh, we're going to find someplace else where you fit. And if you don't fit really well, we'll just get a bigger hammer and pound you into, this, into this, the round hole, you know, being a square peg that you are, being a, a service member. Uh, this notion of co-construction of identity is a lot more powerful idea and I think a lot more palatable to at least many of the veterans that I know. So the idea is if we develop our interpersonal skills more intentionally and engage with other people at a, a higher level of standards, you know, we think about our service values as being high standards, and we find those uh, of others that we intersect with and build on that and, and emphasize that and not uh, you know, go into, you know, into uh, uh, shock because we're encountering other things, then we have the ability to uh, co-construct a better social world and uh, get a better identity for ourselves. So, and I did learn that from Marine. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm being serious uh, for a minute. But uh, this was one of the, the gentlemen that I interviewed for uh, a dissertation research that I was doing. And uh, he said, most people think that you know, if, you're, if you're a Marine, you're just going to go ahead and we're going to stamp little Marines out of a cookie cutter. And that's not how it works, because Marines are much smarter than that. And what they'll do is they, they won't just take somebody else's identity and do what their drill sergeant tells them to do. They're going to find out, okay, I like what that guy's doing. That's, that guy is the best rifleman in, in this uh, unit, and I'm going to take that part of him, but I'm just not going to, I'm not going to become him. That's not, that's not what we're all about. Yes, I'm going to follow all these values, but uh, I also want to see this other guy who's always sitting over there reading, and he always understands... Uh, you know, what's going on behind the scenes, and I want to be like that guy too a little bit. So we put our identities together in a more complex type of way. This is a model for doing that. We call the storytelling model, and the problematic aspect of it, uh, of course, we are storytelling beings. We tell our stories. Uh, we have stories live, but they don't always match the stories we tell, and there are those untellable stories uh, our friend back here that, that uh, couldn't talk about certain things for 40 years, again, uh, my hat's off to you for being able to finally do that. But these untellable stories have some value to us and to others, but we don't always have a way to engage them. Uh, again, this is part of the, uh, the, the model, but I'm not going to dwell on it, other than to say that when we look at these untellable stories uh, in the history of human beings and... and, uh, and uh, philosophy and so forth, uh, we, uh, and, and the great mystics have all gone through this. We encounter the things that we can't talk about. So uh, one of our communication theorists, Mr. Branham, has said uh, there's really four responses to this in ineffability. One is we just don't talk about it. We clam up. We don't say anything. So that's partial or, or total silence. And, and that's what we don't want because that turns inward. That's a problem. Uh, then there's ex explicitly qualified expression. This is when we're starting to get out there, well, this could have happened, but maybe it wasn't exactly like that, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. In the Navy, we call those sea stories. Okay, they're, they're great illustrative things, but they're not necessarily the truth because you, you can't handle the truth. Uh, oh, I'm getting my metaphors really mixed up now. 
then there is poetic evocation. Again, this is where uh, songwriting, uh, drama, uh, and, and so forth come in. Very healthy ways of expression and interpreting uh, meaning. And then uh, there's the bad stuff, self-destruction, identity expression. Uh, that's uh, drinking to excess, using illicit drugs, that's up to and including suicide. That's the bad stuff we want to stay away from. So again, we have a range of options. The question is, how do we engage veterans in moving forward? I, I, I vote for door number three, but that's, that's just me. Um, I am going to have to accelerate, so I'm good. Wow, that's great. Uh, another book, David Kreisinger, See Me for Who I Am. He's a... Uh, uh, an English literature teacher at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. He's done some brilliant work with student veterans in just helping them to write their stories. And I thought this was an interesting thing. He said when he talked to his freshmen, and this, this writing course is a, a requirement for all uh, incoming student veterans at uh, Wisconsin Stevens Point. Uh, he asked them, well, what skills did you get from the military? 82% of them say leadership. Okay, cool. Now, can you, can you tell your stories about leadership? 79% uh, said yes, that's not too bad. But then the question is, why can't you sell, tell, your, share your story if you can't? And out of those guys, the, uh, the big one was civilians just don't understand, they don't get me at all, they don't understand the military. Uh, I'm afraid if I tell this story, I'm gonna get stigmatized, I'm gonna be you know, typecast as this, this uh, grunt. Uh, and it's not uh, acceptable in this social world, so I can't do it, or I'm gonna offend somebody's uh, political ideology, whatever it might be, my sense of political correctness. Oh, I'm not, I, we are not politically correct. So uh, those are barriers to getting these stories told. So we think about how do we create space in our society for that, that's one way. Uh, adult education, uh, again, this is one uh, that I think would be very interesting to educators, but we probably don't have any in here at the moment, so I'm gonna leave this off, other than to say there's a whole uh, methodology to be used in higher education in engaging veterans in the classroom in a way that helps draw their experience out and make it part of the learning. It's called andragogy uh, uh, and transformative learning. Uh, Malcolm Knowles and Jack Meserau are the two main theorists. If you're really interested in that stuff, uh, this is a whole notion, if you want to talk about how do you create post-traumatic growth or take a negative experience and make something positive about it, this is the technology for doing that. Uh, why is it important? Uh, a wonderful guy named George Valiant, he's 95 years old, drinks two glasses of wine a day, uh, has a wicked sense of humor. Uh, George has been involved in what's called the Harvard Grant Study, which is tracking World War II veterans over their lifespans. There's still a few of them around, and he's still tracking them. And what George concluded, and I thought this was stunning, uh, wh what is it that helps veterans, and quite frankly, probably anybody else, thrive throughout their, their life course? And uh, he tracked all these, uh, these ideas like, okay, are, are we going to... Uh, Track your development, are you on, ta on track with that? Childhood strengths, so were you formed you know, at, at that level? Uh, social class, and then he tracked years of, of in being involved in education, and at about the age of 47 or so, all of a sudden, staying involved in education, when I would say that, that broadly applies to any kind of learning, reading, whatever, improving yourself, uh, goes way beyond any other factor. So you think about that, if, if you're trying to help somebody grow and stay adjusted, then uh, that's the way to do it. Uh, adult theory is we bring in, uh, it's, it's participative, it's not passive. We draw on our experiences and it has practical implications. Again, veterans are among, uh, uh, above everything else, practical beings in most cases. Uh, so now, uh, this is my wrap-up here. I want to say one of the ways to think about this uh, was introduced by some friends of mine called the Combat Hippies. I uh, wish they could have been here today. Maybe if we do this conference again, we'll get one or two of them. We'll do a little improv. Uh, but uh, improvisation, either in music or in uh, storytelling or whatever, is one of those skills that helps bring us together, right? Because we're co-creating. We're not just uh, delivering something uh, passive, passive sender, passive receiver, but we're co-constructing something together. And so these guys have kind of figured out
uh, the best way to tell our story as veterans and the way to engage other people in it is to do some, uh, some interesting things with drama, and they do. Uh, and they, they invite the community in to be a part of it. And uh, that's what they want to do is engage people. Again, you'll have this to look at later if you want to see their Facebook page. It's some very cool stuff and it's always changing. Uh, the measures of post-traumatic growth are, uh, again, in keeping with our discussion today, they're social, their the ability to relate to others, understanding new possibilities, that thinking ahead in time, capitalizing on our personal strengths and being self-aware of that. Uh, having a, a change in our spirituality and ability to appreciate life. So that's, uh, that's kind of what it's all about. Uh, Nietzsche said it, if it doesn't hurt me or it doesn't kill me, it's going to make me stronger. Uh, social support and, uh, uh, and mental discipline are the big enablers. The opposite of that is social isolation, perceived burdensomeness, loss of power, identity, identity and efficacy. And that's what Jeff Bird's going to talk with you about later on today. And uh, the word uh, for, uh, for this uh, at the extreme state, we talk about community, but what is community really? It, it gets used for all different things. Uh, one of the uh, uh, anthropologists uh, of our, uh, that had a great deal of influence on our thinking identified the sense of community that we're really looking for. And Martin Luther King identified this also. He called it the beloved community. This is where we have unconditional love and regard for our fellow human beings, acceptance, trust, and reciprocity. And uh, the, there's also this notion of sometimes being, a, uh, being very intense and yet temporary and uh, refreshing us, renewing us, and reinvigorating us, and, be, and helping us to reach out to others. So that's what we're shooting for. There's some references about it, and that's what uh, I'd like to leave you with to have uh, conversations with each other over lunch. Thank you very much.